Try this problem. The first thing that we do is redraw the original molecule. So I've redrawn the picture down here. So I've simply redrawn the original picture, trying not to make any modifications. Uh, but you know, you know what my experience is? A lot of the time when I try to redraw a picture, um, eventually I discover that I actually misdrew it. I actually added a carbon, or dropped a carbon, or changed the structure in some way that I didn't mean to do. I'm sick and tired of that happening. I want to put a stop to that. I don't want to miss, get, lose any more points on tests for stupid mistakes like just not putting in the right number of carbons. If only there was a way to make sure that I wouldn't make that mistake. Well, there is a way, numbering. So I've numbered the original picture, and now I'm going to try to put those numbers in corresponding locations down here. And if I, if I fail, if somehow the numbers don't match up, I'll know I made a mistake. Now I can see that all the numbers match up. For example, up here, the first arrow is, has a tail between the 5 and the 6. And down here, the first arrow has a tail between the 5 and the 6. Then we have a tail between the 7 and the 8, between the 7 and the 8. We can see up here that the last arrow is pointing towards the 11, where there's a positive charge. Well, down here, the 11 also has a positive charge. Um, we can see over here that from 15 to 16 is a single bond, and from here, 15 to 16 is a single bond. So with the numbers, I can be sure that every portion of this picture corresponds to the picture on the top. Remember again that this numbering is not supposed to reflect the official IUPAC nomenclature. These are just reference numbers to make sure that we've drawn the correct picture. Okay, um, now for this problem we're not going to need the numbers anymore, so now that I know that I've drawn the picture correctly, I'm going to erase the numbers. It is completely unacceptable to miss a problem because you accidentally added carbons, or dropped carbons, or changed the structure of the carbon skeleton. What's that? What a silly way to miss a problem. Let's decide that we're never going to miss a problem for that reason again. The way to avoid adding and dropping carbons and changing the carbon structure is to number the original picture and then number the new picture. Um, how do you know when you need a number? When there's the slightest possibility that you might accidentally uh, misdraw the structure. How do you know if you're not numbering enough? Well, if you ever have a situation where you've accidentally added carbons or dropped carbons or changed the structure, you're not numbering enough. Again, it's ridiculous to miss a problem just because you dropped or added carbons. Don't let that happen. Build the habit of using numbers when there's the least possible chance of making a mistake and drawing the carbon structure. This is one of the most useful techniques in organic chemistry, and it's amazing how, how resistant students are to use it. Um, use numbering. All right, now we're going to go arrow by arrow. We start at the initial tail. That's coming from the pi bond. So I erase the pi bond. This is the initial tail, um, so we have to change a charge. This is the atom at the tail. Not this one, but this is the, in atom, uh, the initial atom at the tail. It started neutral, and it's losing electrons, so it becomes positive. And I can erase that tail. Here's the head. It indicates we're forming a pi bond. Draw the pi bond. Now we're in the middle of the string of arrows, so no need to change the charges. Erase the head. Now we go on to this tail. By the way, notice that for, uh, for um, a few seconds here, we've actually broken the octet rule, because there's two bonds here, two bonds here, and there's also a bond to a hidden hydrogen. But we're not worried about that. The only reason we're breaking the octet rule is because we haven't 
um, move the electrons for this arrow yet. So that's no problem. That problem, that's going to go away in a second. So here we are at the tail. It's coming from the pi bond, so let's erase the pi bond. I hope you're using pencil. We can't use the redraw and modify technique unless we're using pencil. We're in the middle of the string of arrows. No need to change the charges, erase the tail. Now we go to this head. This head is in the middle of the sigma bond, so it's creating a new pi bond. No need to change any charges because we're in the middle of the string of arrows, so we can erase that head. Now we go to this tail. This tail is coming from the middle of the pi bond, so we erase that pi bond. No need to change any charges, because we still have not reached the final head. Erase that tail. Here we are at the final head. This head is pointing to the sigma bond. That means we're creating a pi bond. We're not creating a lone pair. How would I indicate it if we were creating a lone pair? Well, then the head would have to be pointing directly at an atom. Instead, it's pointing to the middle of the sigma bond. That means we make a pi bond. Since we're at the final head, um, we have to change this charge. This atom is starting positive, and it's gaining electrons, so it becomes neutral. Now we can erase that head. As always, now we have to check the charges. The net charge in the top picture was plus one, and the net charge in the bottom picture is plus one. So the charges balance. Make sure that you do not make any modifications where there are no errors. These two pi bonds are totally untouched. And these two pi bonds are totally untouched. You should only modify where um, there are errors. Remember that we only change the charges at the initial tail and the final head. Uh, and of course, we change this charge at the initial tail as soon as we're dealing with that tail. Don't wait till the end to do the charges. The charges are the whole reason that we're doing the problem. As soon as you're dealing with the initial tail, fix its charge. Now, I hope you can see that this was not the atom at the initial tail. This atom is not changing its charge. It's not gaining electrons or losing electrons. This pi bond is staying. This is the atom at the initial tail. It's the one that's losing the pi bond. Make sure you see clearly which is the atom that's initially losing the electrons. By the way, there's many other resonance structures that are possible here. We are not trying right now to draw all the possible resonance structures. All we're doing is I'm giving you the electron pushing arrows, and we're making sure that you know how to draw the resonance structure based on the electron pushing arrows. But we're not trying to draw every single possible resonance structure, just the one that's suggested by the arrows that I'm giving to you. And again, this is not really a realistic because um, on practice problems and exams, you will almost never be given the arrows. You have to come up with the arrows on your own. But as I've already mentioned, um, this is a difficult subject, and it's pointless to, come up, to try to come up with the arrows on your own unless you're a master of dealing with arrows that are already given to you. So we still haven't gotten to the most important part of the videos, but we have to work our way up to that. Uh, one other thing I would mention is, uh, eventually in these videos, we're going to get to the point where you are drawing on your own all of these significant resonance structures for um, a molecule. You're going to learn how to draw all the significant resonance structures for a molecule. And we're going to see that when you do that, if you're trying to make sure that you're drawing all the significant resonance structures, you're almost never going to use more than two arrows. If you're really trying to be systematic and get all the significant resonance structures, you yourself are pretty much never going to put in more than two electron pushing arrows at a time. So you would actually never put in three separate arrows like we did here, because if you do that, you're actually going to miss some of the resonance structures. Uh, so why are we going over this? Well, sometimes you're not trying to get every significant resonance structure. Sometimes you're just trying to get a particular resonance structure. For example, maybe we were just interested to see whether we could get a positive charge on this carbon. Well, in order to do that, you don't need to worry about all the other places the positive charge can be. So it is quite valuable to know how to deal with multiple uh, electron, pushing, uh, electron pushing arrows. I think I'm going to erase this now to give myself some more room on the board, but please make sure you have this in your notes. Remember that there's only three types of transitions, lone pair to pi bond, pi bond to lone pair, and pi bond to pi bond. And you're not allowed to go from one lone pair to another lone pair. So I hope you'll actually put this in your notes and have it prominently in front of you. Uh, but my space is limited here on the board, so I'm going to erase this.